Hello, I have an appointment with Dr. Solver. Dr. Problem Solver. Okay, you need to fill out these forms, okay? And you're gonna need to sign on the front and the back, and then show there, there, and there. I, I really don't have time for forms. This is crazy. Um, I need to see him immediately. Sir, if you have an emergency, let me call 911. No, no, it's not like that. You don't understand. I have a giant problem. Okay, so does everyone else here? So I'm gonna need you to take a seat, fill all those forms. <laughs> Ma'am, I don't, I don't, I just don't think you get it. Do you know who I am? No, what's your name? David. David, last name. You know, David, the man after God's own heart, the loved. Mm -hmm. No, just I don't know questions. if you fully grasp the situation or what's about to happen. Okay, um, I can't help you unless you fill those out. Look, I do not have time for this. Can you tell me which office this is? I'll tell you once you fill those out. Which office is his? Sir, he's really booked right now, so if you can just fill out the form and take a seat, please. Or I'm gonna call security. That's him behind me, isn't it? Yeah. I'm gonna have to borrow this. Well, <laughs> well, if you don't really understand the context of that video, we're gonna get to that in a minute. What I wanna do, though, is sort of set up the series that we began last week in case you missed it so that you can understand what we're talking about. I, I was uh, talking by Zoom with some pastor friends this week, some close friends of churches like ours who, who lead churches like ours, and we try to catch up fairly regularly, and we were asking the question that we begin every conversation with, just like you do, how's it going? That's the question that you ask when you're checking in with friends and other people. How's it going? And the answer, we started out the conversation like that. The answer, you know the answer already. How's it going? Well, coronavirus, that's how it's going. A barrage of negativity and hatefulness on social, social media, that's how it's going. How about racism, riots, regulation, and uncertainty? That's how it's going. And so we're all talking together, and we're faith leaders, we're we're trying to sort out all this mess and keep a big picture perspective and somehow, somehow help the church thrive with 50% capacities and 100% mortgages and rent payments. And this lament, you know, we did some griping for a while and all of us were kind of doing it. And finally I said, you know, it's just not that fun of a time to be a pastor, is it? Nope. I also met with some friends of mine this week, some people that I know who are police officers. And I started out the conversation every time saying something like, how's it going? Huh, how's it going? People who used to respect my badge now throw rocks at it. The communities who not long ago revered us now riot at us. And I'm scared to even do the public service job that I was trained and hired and sworn to do. And this goes on for a little while in each case. And, and I say something like, it's not really a fun time to be a cop right now, is it? Nope. By the way, I thanked every one of these men and women for doing what they do to keep us safe, for their dedication in the face of a few bad cops, because most of our law enforcement people are deeply committed public servants who sacrifice every day so that I can sleep well at night and so that you can sleep well at night. So in these conversations, it's not uncommon for me to cry with these people because they feel so attacked right now. And we ought to champion needed reforms while at the same time heaping gratitude and honor on those worthy of it, and we can do both at the same time. I continued this week to talk with some other people, my friends of color, particularly learning from them about life before and since the whole world fell apart. My interview with my friend Charlie Williams on Instagram TV this past Monday, which is still there and you can still watch it, it was heartbreaking to hear story after story from a person I know, not a headline, not a spin, not a political slogan, but somebody I know about the ways that people have treated him, specific things they've said to him, names that they've called him, sometimes when he was just trying to help. I cried during that conversation, it just broke me. 
which is a common thread for me in these talks. I've had, I'm having lots of these talks where I learn what I was so blissfully unaware of not all that long ago, that people really are treated with hatred and disdain by all kinds of people just because of the color of their skin. This should not be, and it cannot be anymore. This is a challenging time for all of us, for all of us from newly minted homeschool parents to teachers to cops to community advocates to college students who are back at home to graduates looking for a job and small business owners. And we've all got some good days and we can say that, but it's still okay to acknowledge and to admit that this is a hard season for all of us, for our culture and our society and, and for us as individuals. And maybe the way that we can find some hope is to acknowledge that the future is not here. The future is there, somewhere else. And that's what this series is about. It's about stepping toward the future. It's about moving from where we are right now to where we need to be. And I wanna be clear about this. I'm not talking about you achieving whatever it is you want. I'm talking about us discovering and achieving what God wants. I'm talking about a deliberate, intentional, but often challenging advance to a horizon that we can sometimes see, but most of the time we don't know how to get there, especially in moments like this. But that horizon is attainable if we're willing to pay the price. So last week we started off this series by reigniting our God-designed capacity to dream again. We talked about how we've been holed up for so long we forgot about how to dream big. The horizon really begins with a divinely inspired dream, something that God put in here. Today, in order to move beyond the dream, we must do something that nobody likes to do, nobody wants to talk about doing, but we have to face the giant. You have to face your giant. And I promise you this, everybody has one, at least one. There is something for all of us, at least one obstacle that stands between or tries to stand between you and the horizon where God wants you to go. And we're gonna get to some examples of what your giant might be in a few minutes. But first, let's glance at the biblical story about this the great story of david's giant problem if you can relate to the receptionist in the video we saw a minute ago and maybe you have no idea who david was i'd like to give you a little bit of background he is revered today and has been revered for centuries he's described in the bible as a man after god's own heart he wasn't perfect by any means. In fact, he had a kind of a critical flaw, maybe like all of us do, but still God saw in him a leader even when nobody else saw it. He certainly didn't look the leader part. He didn't always act the leader part, but God knew it was there. And one day, David, who when he was a nobody and nobody knew who he was, David sees something that moves him to action. And it's in this moment that David really springs, springboards onto the scene. It happened when the people of God, and the people of God are often called the Israelites, or, Jew, or the Jews or Jewish people, the Israelites come face to face with what appeared to be an insurmountable challenge. Even though these people had God on their side, the God, they still gave up. Because Goliath, the giant, seemed like an unsolvable problem, and they thought that maybe even God couldn't overcome it. So we're gonna read about it in 1 uh, Samuel chapter 17. I'm gonna read some excerpts here, and it's a little bit more scripture than I would normally share, so just stay with me. You gotta have it to get the story. Here we go. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. The Philistines were the enemies of the Israelites, and they're at war with each other. Goliath was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, wore a, wore a coat of a scale armor of bronze weighing 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and the point, just its iron point, weighed 15 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. We're gonna come back to that in a second. Goliath stood and shouted out to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Saul is the king of Israel. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man 
and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. So Goliath is huge. He's at least nine feet tall. The scripture doesn't translate exactly into English. He could have been over 10 feet tall. So he's incredibly huge, but not just tall. He's a massive mound of muscle. He's strong, super strong and powerful. He would make Dwayne Johnson look like a little guy. His armor coat, just this, this, this part alone, weighed 125 pounds. So this guy could outthrow, outlift, outfight anybody and anything in his path. He was a killing machine. He was the nuclear weapon of his day. Now, in this day and time, any prominent military officer would have what would be known as an armor bearer. This was a, a guy who would carry the armor for the officer when the officer was not actually in battle. Saul, the king of Israel, he had an armor bearer. Normal armor would weigh about 60 pounds. That's why you had somebody carry it for you. But Goliath's total armor package weighed more than 272 pounds, which is why Goliath only had a shield bearer. It's the only time in the whole Bible we see the phrase uh, translated shield bearer. Nobody was big enough to carry Goliath's armor. And the English translations don't really do justice in the Bible about the sentiment of the Israelites, what was happening inside of them. The New Revised Standard Version says they were greatly afraid, which sounds, I don't know, somehow cute. The New Living Translation says they were deeply shaken. The Message Version of the Bible says they had lost all hope. They were terrified. In other words, they were so afraid that Goliath would overpower them even though God himself was with them, even though God himself had led them to this place, even though God was on their side, they were frozen. They were paralyzed in fear. They looked at him and they thought, well, who can possibly defeat this guy? He's undefeatable. Anybody would be afraid of him. Everybody was afraid of him. Everybody maybe, except this one guy named David. So David, who nobody really knows about at this time, comes to Saul, makes his way to the king, and he says, don't let anybody be frightened because of that man. I am your servant, and I will go and fight with him. And Saul replied, don't be ridiculous. You can't fight the Philistine. You're only a youth, and he's been a warrior since his childhood. You lack age and experience. See, David is not a fighter. Later on, he would, through, as the story progresses and other details and things we don't have time to talk about today, David develops a reputation as somebody very skilled in wilderness warfare. We might call it today guerrilla warfare. But at this point in his life, he's just a shepherd. He's just a shepherd. He has no skill at all in, in terms of fighting people. So when David goes to the king and says, send me to the giant, I'll fight him, that would be like me calling an NFL coach and telling him to put me in the game as a linebacker. Only bad things can happen to me. That whatever you have in your mind, if you were to close your eyes and you can or you don't have to and sort of imagine what comes to mind when I say things like a studly man's man, warrior kind of image, whatever you see there, David is the opposite of that. I mean, he might work out, but he's never gonna be very big. And King Saul is in a bad spot because King Saul is terrified, paralyzed with fear, and so's the whole army. Remember now, he's got thousands of people. Nobody is willing to face Goliath. But David, this scrawny little shepherd boy is, who is barely an adult, is apparently willing to commit suicide. And Saul looks at the situation and thinks, what do I have to lose? So David says to Saul, your servant, he's talking about himself now, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine, which is to say he's not one of us, he's not a Jewish person, will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go 
and the Lord be with you. This right here is humor. When you read the Bible, sometimes we read it so fast we skip over the funny parts. Saul says to David, go and the Lord be with you. Let me translate. I hope God's with you because we ain't. So go and the Lord be with you. And then he, David, took his staff in his hand chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. He went towards uh, Goliath, went towards the giant. Meanwhile, the Philistine, Goliath, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. So see the scene now, they're coming towards each other, both of them, moving towards each other. David said to the Philistine, so he calls him from some distance as he's moving, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, for the battle is the Lord's. The battle is his, and he will give all of you into our hands. So as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it, and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. So the whole time, the writer here goes out of his way to say they keep moving towards each other, specifically David moving toward Goliath. And David wasn't blind. I mean, he knew he was outskilled. He knew that he was undersized, and he knew he wasn't experienced in hand-to-hand combat, at least not hand-to-hand combat against a giant. Though David said all of the right things, and what we have in the scripture is a recording of David seemingly like he was completely unafraid, I, again, like to read between the lines in the Bible. I like to see the scene. We don't get a video of it. All we get is the written word. We have to imagine what might have been happening inside of David. I want to imagine what the prayer that David might have mouthed as he approached the battle line. Because I just can't imagine that as he sees this giant, it's humanly impossible for David to beat him, that David is not saying something like, hey God, I'm not 100% sure why I said I would do this. I thought at one point I heard you tell me to do it, now I'm not so sure, and I'm asking you God, if you didn't actually say it, could you adopt it as your idea now? because I can't do this without you. Now remember, this is a day before there were binoculars, at least not high-tech binoculars like we have them today. So, So in the distance, the giant doesn't look so big. And the closer that David gets to Goliath, remember he's coming towards him, the larger the giant becomes. The bigger the giant is, the bigger you imagine he is, the bigger you see the giant is, the more the flight side of fight or flight instinct kicks in, right? So when you're coming up against a massive, a massive giant that you cannot beat, what do you do? You run. You run like crazy. You run like your life depends on it, right? But here's the thing. When you run away from the giant, when you run like crazy in the other direction, and when you're finally done running and you turn around and look, the giant is still there between you and where you need to go, between you and where God wants you to go, and the only way to defeat the giant is to go towards him and to face him. See, David had a giant problem, literally. You and I also have a giant problem, but it might not be quite as obvious as Goliath. Our our giant might not be nine or 10 feet tall, might not have 200 plus pounds of armor on, but our giant can be just as strong, can even be stronger. So I want to consider with you a few. Some giants I'm going to name might be on your list, or your giant might be something else, but you have one. I promise there's a giant at least trying to stand between you and the horizon where God wants you to go. And remember, the only way to defeat your giant is to go towards him and to face him. So here are some possibilities. There is the giant of fear. Was David afraid as he approached Goliath? We're not, we're not given any information that says he was, but I can't imagine that he didn't have some kind of natural fear inside of him. And in this way, David was no different than King Saul, no different than all of the army of Israel and all the men there. All of them were afraid. Everybody was afraid. What made David different 
was not, that, not the absence of fear, which I think he did have to have some of, but that he chose not to give in to his fear. He chose to act on something else. He chose to act on what he believed God was telling him to do, what he believed about the power of God itself. David basically said, this battle belongs to God. I'm not the one who picked this fight. This battle belongs to God. And essentially, David said, I'm not the one who will win this fight. God will. See, it turns out that the opposite of fear is not courage and it's not bravery. It's faith. David moved on his faith in God, not his fear of the circumstances. See, when you're afraid of something that's in your way, it's normal. It's even human. But with faith, I don't have to give in to my fear. I can fight my fear and I can win over it. Faith is what rids my soul of the fear that wants to keep me down, a fear that wants to stop me from the horizon where God wants me to go and the future that God wants me to realize, fear really isn't just about the way that I feel. Fear fear isn't just a feeling. See, fear wins when I act on my fears instead of acting on my faith in God. William Bennett wrote a book called The Book of Virtues, which I commend to you, it's very good, and And he said in there that being afraid is a perfectly appropriate emotion when we are confronted by fearful things. I also think about Herman Melville's character, Starbuck, the chief mate in his book, Moby Dick. And in that book, he said, I will have no man in my boat who is not afraid of a whale. See, fear is normal. I would even argue it's a useful giant if it's working for you and not standing in your way, keeping you from where God needs you to go, where God wants you to go, to the horizon he has for your future. You can overcome your fear giant by swallowing hard, acknowledging that you're afraid, but then moving forward, not away from the thing that makes you afraid. See, the Bible says that fear doesn't come from God. It teaches us that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-control. I can lean into these things even while I acknowledge that fear is still inside of me. I have to trust this. When God leads me to a dangerous place, when God leads me into dangerous circumstances, and sometimes he does, the best choice I can make is to actually follow him there. David, the little boy who beat the giant, wrote these iconic words later in his life. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, God, are with me. He trusted in God, his faith in God, more than he did give in to his fear. But fear isn't the only giant. There's also the giant of discontent. The giant of discontent. For many of us, there is a restlessness inside of us that robs us of the fullest life possible. It's darker than ambition. It's more sinister than just a desire to be better, which all of us want. Discontent is the giant that looks around my life and then compares my life with everybody else's life and it isn't satisfied because of the disparity. Instead of taking stock in the enormous ways that I have been blessed, I therefore spend most of my energy focused on what I lack and what I don't have. Discontent is a giant that will lead you to forsake your family in the name of your career. It will shove your marriage aside. It'll leave your kids longing for a parent because what they have is an absent one. It'll even sacrifice your own personal health. All in the name of something you try to justify. And of course, discontent will relegate your investment in a relationship with God to a dusty book on an out of sight shelf that never gets touched. The way that you fight the giant of discontent is to take stock regularly in what you do have, in what God has already given you. Even if you have to schedule it, it's okay. We have to do this. We have to imagine the ways that we are blessed. Paul the apostle one time said, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. 
through Jesus who has already blessed me. I have learned the secret of being content. If you don't know anything about Paul's life, it's worth reading. This guy has been through everything you can imagine. Whatever you've been through, Paul's been through at least that much and worse. And yet he can say, I have learned to beat the giant of discontent. I've learned the secret of being content because I am relying on the power of God inside of me. You can do that too. You can face this giant if we regularly consider all that God has already done for us. There's also the giant of judgment. As giants go, I think this one is hard to see in ourselves because if you poll, if we were to take a poll right now of us here today, most of us would be able to name our fears, but most people are unwilling to name their prejudices. And and I'm not just talking about racial prejudice, which is one kind, of course. I'm talking about a judgmental spirit. And I can relate to this giant because for a good portion of my young adult years, this was the giant in my way. But here's what's funny about it. I thought it was an asset. See, when your giant is judgmentalism, you think he's working for you. Why? Because I thought I was right about everything. So if you and I were talking and you saw things differently from the way that I saw things and I thought I was right, I thought you were wrong. And it's not that I'm making the case today that there is no right and wrong. That's silly. Of course there's a right and a wrong. But I had to face this giant by putting on a huge amount of humility and start seeing the world from a perspective that is not limited to the life of Brian Hughes. That's how I faced this giant. It's how I'm defeating him today. James, the brother of Jesus, teaches that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. So for those of you brave enough to admit that judgmentalism is your giant, hear this. The way you face this giant is to listen to people who think differently from you and try to understand the world through their eyes. It's not that you have to change the way you think. It's the willingness to be vulnerable enough for you to say, maybe I still have more to learn about this. There are so many giants, so many other giants that I've actually done a follow-up video for you that will explore some of these other ones, but we've only got time for one more here today, a big one, the giant of anger. We will never get to the horizon when we give in to anger. It's not that you can't be angry at times, it's not that you shouldn't be angry at times, but when anger wins, you lose. When anger wins, the horizon loses. Anger is an anchor that weighs you down and you drag it around and everybody can see it, everybody except you, that is. Anger is a monster that when fed grows beyond your control, which is why the apostle Paul said, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. This phrase right here, don't give the devil a foothold, he's tying this directly to those of us who let our anger fester inside of us. That's how we give the devil a foothold. So he's not saying you can't be angry. He's saying when you let it fester, it becomes sin. The challenges we face right now in our whole world, they they create a sense of righteous indignation in us. We ought to be mad at injustice. And we ought to be mad about people who are hijacking injustice for their own hidden agenda. Personally, I'm I'm, uh, kind of susceptible to getting angry when somebody takes advantage of me. There's just something in me that just really despises that. When I feel like I'm being treated unfairly or when I'm accused of doing something that I didn't do, I'm accustomed to saying that I do plenty of actual dumb things. You don't have to fabricate stupidity for me. It's somewhat of my spiritual gift. So if you're angry about something, about something that's not fair or right in the world, it's okay. But what you do with your anger is the determining factor as to whether or not it becomes your giant. What you do with your anger is the determining factor as to whether or not it becomes your giant. Paul said, in your anger, Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, 
brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Our giants, all of them have specific nuances from fear to discontent to judgment to anger to insecurity to recklessness to pride On and on we could go. We could list a bunch of giants. And how you conquer your giant is at least in part dependent on the giant itself. They each take a little bit of a different strategy. But there is a common thread. Every giant falls when we face it the way that David did. As he ran toward Goliath, David said, The God who delivered me from the other giants in my life will deliver me from you. Like David, you can say to your giant, you come against me with all your power, but I come against you with all the power of God Almighty, the God of heaven's armies. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. Your giant does not have to win. Your giant doesn't have to keep you from the horizon where God wants you to go, but you have to run toward the giant, not away. Face your giant leaning on your faith in God, surrounded by the one true God, and fighting your giant with the confidence of victory. 